The art of losing isn't hard to master. So many things seem filled with the intent to be lost that their loss is no disaster. Lose something every day, accept the fluster of lost door keys, the hour badly spent. The art of losing isn't hard to master. Then practice losing farther, losing faster, places and names and where it was you meant to travel. None of these will bring disaster. I lost my mother's watch, and look, my last or next to last of three loved houses went. The art of losing isn't hard to master. I lost two cities, lovely ones, and vaster some realms I owned, two rivers, a continent. I missed them, but it wasn't a disaster. Even losing you, the joking voice, a gesture I love, I shan't have lied. It's evident the art of losing's not too hard to master, though it may look like, write it, like disaster. Elizabeth Bishop wrote and rewrote this poem, One Art, before its final publication in The New Yorker in 1976. It is one of the last poems Bishop composed before her death three years later in 1979, and since then it's become one of the most anthologized poems of the 20th century and, in my opinion, one of the best examples of a poet using form to communicate an idea, an experience, in the history of English language poetry. And the form she uses is the villanelle, so in order for me to explain that comment, I need to start there with a description of the villanelle. A villanelle has six stanzas, the first five of which have three lines each. These are known as tercets, and they are followed by a final stanza of four lines, called a quatrain. In a villanelle, the first tercet establishes a central idea that will be explored over and over throughout the poem. Each tercet will follow a strict A, B, A rhyme scheme, and in this case, the only rhymes that will appear in this poem will be aster and ent. More than that, though, in a villanelle, the first and third lines will be repeated throughout the poem in alternating stanzas, and then finally appear as a couplet in the final quatrain. The most famous example of this form of poetry is Dylan Thomas's Do Not Go Gently Into That Good Night, first published in 1951. His first stanza reads, Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. And you'll notice that this establishes that ABA rhyme scheme, and you'll also notice that the first and third lines are repeated word for word in alternating stanzas before appearing as a couplet. Do not go gently into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light in the final lines of the poem. Because the villanelle depends on this repetition, it often takes as its subject a difficult idea that the poet obsesses over and cannot be distracted from. In Thomas's poem, this idea is death, obviously a topic that is easy to turn away from, one that you want to be distracted from, but the form of the villanelle helps the poem or narrator keep a singular focus. In Bishop's poem, the central idea is loss, so let's take Bishop's poem stanza by stanza to see this form in action. The poem actually begins with a playful tone. The art of losing isn't hard to master. So many things seem filled with the intent to be lost that their loss is no disaster. Right away, she turns losing stuff into an art form, and after that attributes the human quality of intention to the many things that seem to want to be lost. And since the things seem intent from being lost from the start, that loss cannot be viewed as a disaster. She has established the central idea and established the central rhyme scheme. 
In the second stanza, the narrator advises us to start slowly, to lose some things like our door keys or an hour of time, and then she repeats that first line, reminding us that losing stuff is a skill like any other, and so long as we practice, we can become masters. In the third stanza, we are encouraged to take that practice farther, faster, and more abstract. We can lose places, names, and even some dreams that we perhaps once had, places that we meant to travel. These are less trivial than the losses of the previous stanzas. The losses are mounting, they are becoming more serious. Now, according to the classic Villanelle structure, the final line of this stanza should be the same as the third line in the poem, but she's changed it a bit while keeping the final word and, of course, the general sentiment that these losses, though bigger, will not bring disaster. In the fourth stanza, the tone starts to shift and we start recognizing a weakness in our narrator. She doesn't admit weakness or anything, she's keeping a brave face, but we can see it if we're paying attention. Before this stanza, all the losses have been abstract, generic door keys, vague names of people and places, but in the fourth stanza, the narrator gets specific, and this gets personal. She lost her mother's watch. She lost a house that she loved. These items, and the words used to describe them, are deeply symbolic in addition to being personal and specific. The watch makes that lost hour from the second stanza more meaningful by linking a symbol of time to a loved one. Particularly if that loved one is no longer with us, this is powerful. This isn't just a watch, and it's not just an hour. It's the mother's watch. It's an hour spent with one's mother. And the use of the word houses instead of homes is curious. It's as if the narrator is attempting to distance herself from the pain of this loss by referring more to the structure of the house than to the feeling of home it must have engendered and represented for her. She doesn't say she lost her mother, but the mother's watch. She doesn't tell us she lost a home with all that would imply, but she lost a house. If the narrator confronted the time she lost with her mother directly, or the memories associated with a home, then those losses might be more difficult to master, but our narrator has had practice losing. She distances herself emotionally by making that lost hour an object, a watch, and by describing the loss of a physical home that she once felt comfortable in as the last or next to last of three loved houses. This allows her to confirm, word for word, in that final line of the stanza, that the art of losing isn't hard to master. And this continues in the final tercet, as her losses get bigger and more serious. She tells us she lost two whole cities, which she expands to call them realms. A word that brings these places, these lovely cities, into the domain of fantasy. We all have those areas of the world that make us feel comfortable, that feel like home to us. But none of us calls those areas realms. Real life isn't D&D. The word itself, realms, creates an emotional distance from the memories of these places, and it allows her to admit that she misses them by making them abstract, almost fictional places. And in doing so, she survives these losses as well, she can still claim that these losses are not a disaster. Again, keeping the rhyme and sentiment in that last line, even if that line is altered, its original form is lost. Which brings us to the final stanza, the quatrain, which begins with a dash, a pause as if our narrator needs to take an extra breath to pull herself together after the emotional losses have started to take their toll, as if her efforts to overcome those losses are starting to falter. After that dash, the poem reaches its emotional climax as the narrator addresses the loss of an actual human being, not a memory and not a physical object associated with a human being, but an actual person one that the narrator knows and loves intimately. She knows the nuances of a joking voice or a gesture. 
At this point, the playful tone from that first stanza is entirely gone. The consciousness of the narrator is split here, and she uses parentheses to distance herself and separate these intimate details from the rest of the poem, but they creep into the poem structure anyway. Even with the intimate details, and even with this deeply emotional loss creeping into the poem that is supposed to be about practicing and mastering the art of accepting loss, the narrator maintains that she has not lied yet, and for the first time she modifies that first line of the poem to say that the art of losing is not too hard to master. And now the structure of the villanelle demands that that next line, the final line of the poem, keep the rhyme and the sentiment that, as line 3 says, the loss is no disaster. Here the emotion of the narrator enters the poem poignantly by admitting that this loss and this specific loved one seems to be a disaster. Again, the parenthetical voice has to enter for the second time in the stanza and the poem to demand that the narrator finish the poem with that final word, write it. The structure of the poem provides the choreography for how to continue, for how to overcome and master this particular art, the art of losing. The literal act of writing helps save the narrator from disaster. It only seems like a disaster. She will survive it. Elizabeth Bishop knew about loss. Her father died when she was eight months old, and her mother's grief made her distant even before she was institutionalized before Elizabeth's sixth birthday. Essentially, Elizabeth Bishop had lost two parents before she was six years old. She spent some years living in Nova Scotia with her maternal grandparents before moving in with her paternal grandparents in Massachusetts, but she had to leave that home as well due to abuse and depression. Essentially, she had lost three homes before she was 10 years old. From those tragic beginnings, her independence expressed itself in extensive travel. In 1951, she, for example, earned a $2,500 travel fellowship from Bryn Mawr College to write about South America. While there, she fell in love with an architect in Brazil and stayed with her on her partner's estate, which very well could be described as a realm, for 15 years. The relationship became turbulent and eventually ended when her partner overdosed on tranquilizers. Elizabeth Bishop had experienced loss in her life. When she wrote this poem, One Arts, near the end of her life, she was struggling with a new relationship, and in her old age, she was also losing many friends and mentors that she had had throughout her life. So it is easy to look at this poem through the lens of that biography. I think, though, that the poem transcends her individual experience. It may have autobiographical elements, but the text itself can stand alone, it communicates a wisdom beyond any individual person's experience. We watch as this narrator starts off playfully, wanting innocently to believe that loss is always trivial, and that loss can be discussed under a single heading, that losing one's keys and losing a home can be discussed together as one art. And then, slowly, as the losses pile up, the narrator breaks down, but just as life continues, even as we experience loss, the villanelle form demands that the poet continue, and the structure of the poem props her up just as the structure of our days or our rituals support us during tough times. Bishop wrote 17 drafts of this poem before it found its final form, and as late as draft 11, the poem ended on a tragic rather than resilient note. In those drafts, she sketched out two possible endings. My losses haven't been too hard to master with this exception, say it, this disaster. Or she played around with the idea of ending it with, it's evident the art of losing isn't hard to master with one exception, write it, write disaster. <laughs> 
The poem's final form demonstrates a bravery to continue that those earlier drafts simply do not. Instead, this final version shows us how poetry and art can give us the structures to continue, even when life may look like a disaster. That inner voice commanding her to literally write it helped her survive this loss, and in the process, it gave the 20th century one of its greatest poems. Thank you for sticking with this video about a poem until the very end. I'll be returning to the visual arts next month. I hope you enjoyed this video. It's a bit of a different style from my usual. I will see you again next month.